Good morning again, everybody. So we're back. Oh, don't know what the weather's like where everybody is, but yeah, I just went outside for a bit of sun and it's very windy down here in Kent at the moment. Um, so yeah, don't know what it's like for everybody else. Matthew, what's it like for you? Tropical, it does it. Is it tropical, is it? Yeah, <laughs> tropical, good stuff. Um, well, listen, yeah, Matthew, so you're going to be um, chatting to us today about... Um, the public health significance of urban pests, which I think there's a lot of people here who are going to be particularly interested in that topic. So yeah, without further ado, I'd like to yeah ask you to yeah tell us a bit about the, the subject you're talking about. Great, thanks, Natalie. I'll just uh, do the honours and hit the share share screen. How does that look, Natalie? All loud and clear. You can see the title slide. Yep, we can see that perfectly. Excellent, lovely. Um, thanks very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to join uh, World Pest Day. Um, looking forward to the, the rest of the day and uh, my talk today is the public health significance of urban pests and for folks that haven't seen me around before I'm, I'm Matthew Davis and I'm the head of technical department at, at Kill Germ. It feels like a nice broad topic to cover today sort of global significance and uh, we'll tackle quite a few research projects that Kill Germ have been involved with with universities it's, it's always a nice thing to do some original research that promotes the importance of public health pest control and just provides new information to help us do our jobs in a, in a good way. Um, so going through some of the affiliations there, um, I'll take you through a bit of a history of Kill Germ's link with Aston University. We've done plenty of research regarding flying insects and their public health significance, the type of bacteria that they can carry and some potential impacts there um, in lab settings, in hospital settings, and more recently in, in households as well. And um, moving on from that, sort of wrapping up the presentation nearer the end, um, I'm excited to introduce a, a brand new study um, in collaboration with the University of Reading. And nice to mix things up. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an insect man by heart, um, but we're looking at uh, rodents and their potential carriage of, of pathogenic bacteria as well. So an interesting new project. Uh, we've got links with the University of Birmingham as well. We do some teaching there and they've assisted Aston University. So I think it's a nice thing that we're, we're getting the word out in the wider industry, but also to other stakeholders and hopefully at the same time promoting the importance of public health pest control. And um, a little thank you as well. I'll say it again when we get to the University of Reading work. Um, I'm thinking there'll be a number of BPCA members watching today that, has, that have helped us uh, with that with that project in, a, in an anonymous way, but we're very thankful for that. So a lot of this work is uh, done by people on the on the ground and I get to the nice bit and do a PowerPoint presentation. So um, I should say just something briefly about the um, the three images there. What, one of them is a pest and that's me, I'm the one in the middle. Um, on this side we've got um, the, the tarsal segments of a fly, we can see it's quite hairy, we can imagine how insects can scoop up particles of matter that will contain bacteria and then deposit that on surfaces, so that's mechanical transfer of bacteria. And on the right hand side, we've got examples of, of bacterial cells. Um, so certainly these things are capable of being moved around by pests. And every time we control pests, we're limiting that threat to, to human health for those exact reasons. Good. Um, so hopefully the sound will work on, on this one. Um, anyone who's seen me give Kill Germ presentations before, I think I must be contractually obliged to show this video on um, on this particular fly in the, in the toilet. So some of you will know what's coming. It's a nice summary of what I'm about to cover actually. So uh, enjoy this one, at least it's not just before lunch break. Flies also have dreadful habits. They too feed on animal droppings and rotting flesh before landing on food prepared for us. The trouble is that flies cannot eat solid food. So to be able to eat it, they have to liquefy it first which they do by vomiting on it. At the same time, they will be contaminating the food with bacteria from the hairs on their legs and their excrement. Then they make it into a form of soup, which they suck back up through their mouth parts. And when they're finished, it's your turn. Food poisoning outbreaks can occur from minute doses of bacteria. Because of this, disease can easily be spread by flying insects fact which is rarely understood or appreciated. So yeah, familiar video to some, perhaps Natalie could just check that that came through loud and clear, otherwise I'll go back and do the commentary over it. It did, yeah, it was, it was, we could definitely hear it, yeah. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, I do like to show that one, I think um, 
certainly sometimes the perception of your customers, and by that I mean you know, members of the public and food outlets and so on, um, customers of pest controllers, there's a different perception between pests. You know, we, we don't really tolerate um, cockroach activity. A cockroach runs across our plate, we'll ditch our food in the bin. Um, fly activity, I think sometimes there's that little bit of tolerance to that. And having seen that video, I hope that changes uh, the perception for, for lots of people. You could arguably um, make the case that, that flies are perhaps more dangerous than cockroaches because they are more mobile. Um, and they certainly do have that potential to carry pathogenic bacteria. So nice, nice little fit there. Okay, um, moving on to some of the Aston University research, uh, relatively recent studies by the research team there. Um, and hats off to our student Federica Boyocci, who did a huge amount of work for us, um, that collaboration between Kill Germ, Aston University, with assistance from the University of Birmingham as well. Um, also credit to Anthony Hilton uh, for, for managing these, these projects with my, my input as industrial supervisor. And we've been very lucky to present our work on, on flying insects and, and other insects um, at international conferences. Uh, we had the chance to present our combined work at 2017 International Conference on Urban Pests in Birmingham. And we also made it to Barcelona in 2022. Not everybody's been able to get to Barcelona, so I'll give a rundown of what we, we talked about there, some of our findings. And um, I won't make it too heavy as well, because I'm conscious it's a Tuesday morning, uh, so we need sort of headline information. But not nice to get out there and fly the flag for public health uh, pest management. Um, starting off, um, going back to the earlier years when I was doing the, the research as a, as a student at Aston University in conjunction with Killgerm, and we looked at the potential here of some peer-reviewed studies, some scientific papers about house flies and their potential to transfer, to move around Clostridium difficile, one of the so-called hospital superbugs that can really have an impact on people um, that have their gut flora wiped out by antibiotic therapy. They can be a real risk of colonization with C. diff, to give it the colloquial term, uh, which can lead to severe diarrhea, colitis, and in some cases, death. So an important hospital-acquired uh, pathogen. In the lab setting, the housefly is capable of acquiring this from deposits and moving it around for a period of time. So more on that as we, uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, following on from that study, we looked in a curious way, a housefly larvae, uh, there aren't too many studies on, on juvenile stages of insects uh, and carriage and retention of bacteria. Um, so we looked at that too. It did turn out that the adult fly is, is the most significant part of the life cycle, which makes common sense, really. What we like to do, and this is kind of my input from an industry point of view, you know, it's a good thing to do to model things in a lab setting, figure out what insects are capable of transferring which kinds of organisms and, and how they might do that. Um, we like to go out into the field and sample real insects from real situations and find exactly what they carry in those real life settings. And I think that's important. That's almost a practical element that takes us away from the lab. And that's where we get some real good information to build on uh, for our industry. Uh, this is a good study. Um, and myself and Federica teamed up on this one. I, with very sort of uh, helpful pest controllers went round hospitals in the UK, seven of them collected a whole raft of flying insects. We analysed the bacteria that they were carrying. Uh, Federica came in and really built on this project. Um, she looked at the bacteria that I had stored from this initial study and determined um, whether these things were showing levels of antimicrobial resistance. So that was a really good thing to add on top of that, that study. And um, so we'll look at Look at what was found there in just a moment's time. But yeah, just to show that background that we've got this uh, history of studies to uh, to fall back on. So uh, yeah, quite a range of flies as well. Um, people that like the scientific names will be okay, but otherwise we've got blue bottles that we looked at, um, sort of non-target species, lesser house flies, common house fly family, um, foridae, so scuttle flies, psychodidae, the owl midges or drain flies, and then sparaceridae the um, lesser dung flies. I think a, a quip that I made at the time away from the scientific world was something like um, small flies, drain flies are underrated. I still think that holds true. They're present in many situations, harboring pathogenic bacteria, but often overlooked because they're small and it's that perception that larger things must be more important. Uh, so yeah, drain flies are underrated. That's a little sound right for you. Um, these things did hit the, the media. Um, you know, there's an importance from these studies. We've got to be tempered 
with our claims and realistic. Sometimes the media has a, a habit of, of blowing things up to be slightly bigger than they are. Um, but we're always grateful for that sort of publicity and recognition of our studies. So some of the broadsheets reported quite well on this study. Um, and, you know, the Nursing Times took a sort of uh, balanced view of the findings as well. Always good to be realistic with the claims. And there's a little reminder um, over 20,000 insects were sampled from the hospitals in this study. So it was it was extensive. A lot of work was put, put into this. And there were levels of antibiotic resistance found in the bacteria that these insects were carrying. Um, so some significant findings that really makes us think about uh, public health significance of insects. So it's important thing to try and do. Um, sometimes the results of these studies, original research beneficial, good to know, but they can be buried within scientific journals. Not everybody has got access to these. Uh, it needs to be put out there in common sense, straightforward language, we can all digest and that we can all make use of. And uh, so hopefully that's my, my job today, a bit of communication of key points. Uh, we've, we've been around, um, industry communication is, is part of today actually. And may have seen us at various events. We've been to the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health conference on, on one or two occasions just to get word out there, um, myself and Federica. We've been at Pestex before, so sort of thinking of the, the BPCA and various events that they organise, so we're always good to attend those. Uh, we did a slot of Pest Extra as well when it was online during periods of lockdown. And industry periodicals, I think we were featured in PPC, uh, Today's Technician, and looking to my right as well, the images here are taken from Pest Control News, and yes, there were pathogenic bacteria found on insects that were numerous in hospitals. And there were levels of antimicrobial resistance found as well. But I like this comment here. Um, it's actually from Professor Anthony Hilton, our, our microbiologist. Infection control is taken extremely seriously in the NHS. It's definitely not a dis um, at that setting. Insects will only play a very small role in the transfer of bacteria. So this risk should be seen in the context of wider efforts to stop the spread of harmful and drug resistant bacteria. So it's a piece of the jigsaw, it's a piece of the picture, it's important, um, but it's not the be all and end all for sure. Okay, and um, yep, as well as communicating this to the wider industry, we need to let um, fellow sort of scientists and researchers know as well. I think the insect world is sometimes a little bit hidden um, from the, some of the other types of research. So we, so we need to big up pest control in the academic community as well. And we've done a certain amount of that uh, and some of that is here today so will pest day 6th of june 2023 thanks for uh, thanks for having us um okay so just looking through some of the prior work on house flies and transfer of clostridium difficile the hospital superbug moving out from the lab and into the real world setting i'll summarize what was found um, in the lab settings this hospital superbug the house flies upon contact were able to transfer it uh, for up to four hours and that's just one contact with the deposit. So that's a significant period of time. You can imagine these fires are reseeding themselves with multiple contacts over a period of time, but one contact and then movement will disseminate that for four hours. Spores taken up by the house fly were passed out in their excreta for up to four days. So that's that transfer, that throughput, that carriage for a number of days. So there's significance in that. And um, house fly larvae. Um, did not retain the bacteria through to their adult stage, and that was to be expected. Uh, we just need to do that really to be to be sure. So it was the adult flies that were more significant. Of the bacterial isolates taken from flying insects from the hospital settings, over half of them did show a resistant phenotype to at least one class of antibiotics. Some of them were defined as multi-drug resistant because some of these bacterial isolates, almost 20% of them, showed resistance to more than one class antibiotics and therefore defined as multi-drug resistant. So you could argue there's an enhanced risk to public health from flying insects in hospitals. And I would say there's probably read across. Um, you know, a hospital is a small city, isn't it? You can imagine some similar situations um, in, in various other premises. So I think there's read across, you know, it's hospital specific, uh, but it would make sense in other settings as well. So we moved away from hospitals and got a bit closer to home. Um, Federica had a very deep look into the the household environment, what have we got in our homes? And I like the simple questions of these uh, types of studies. What have we got in our homes in terms of insects and other arthropods, the creepy crawlies? Uh, what are they carrying? What have they got? 
and what are they carrying? How long did we do this work? Well, um, I was asked by Natalie about the temperature. It is pretty tropical in Osset for, for West Yorkshire, but we need to do this work over a 12 month period because of that cycle of the season in the UK. We need to capture that year period uh, for the seasons, for that seasonal activity of insects and other arthropods. And that's what we did. We think that ours is the first survey of uh, indoor insect or arthropod uh, activity in the UK in homes, and um, the, the most extensive survey. So that's that's interesting. And we use traditional techniques uh, to find out what these things were carrying in terms of bacteria. And we had a deeper look at that using molecular biology, using DNA technology. So almost imagine the insect as a crime scene and we're finding the DNA of the, of the criminals, which would be the potentially pathogenic bacteria. So we had a deeper look at that with the aim to update knowledge and inform public health professionals. Um, so I always like to talk about how we did things. Um, results can be interesting, but how it was done. Um, Federica and I and Anthony realised that to survey homes for insects and other arthropods is a big job. So we recruited citizen scientists, a willing team of people in the West Midlands, and they went out and surveyed. It was, it was 20, 20 homes looking after their own homes, their own dwellings. They were capturing uh, insects and other arthropods with corn insect monitors, flying insect monitors with UV light, um, spider catchers and pooters. So they did a lot of the work for us, um, captured those. We would then identify what had been captured. Once we know what we've got, we want to see what do they carry on the outside? So there are various techniques. You can wash the arthropods and you can also find what they've got on the inside by macerating them, mashing them up. It's more technical than that, but we can find out what they carry on the inside and what they carry on the outside. And then we can see what is grown in a lab condition in terms of bacteria. And we can go even further and have a deeper look with DNA technology. And that's what we did. Um, so what did we find? Probably a mind blowing slide for a Tuesday morning. But the headline aspects of this, we found lots, lots of different insects or arthropods from different groups, families, orders, over 2000 specimens and some familiar things, flies, beetles, wood lice, thrips, millipedes, silverfish, moth, mites, fleas, spiders, book bites, ants, bees, wasps, earwigs, springtails, cockroaches and centipedes, a whole range of things. The dominant insects in the indoor setting were the true flies, followed by silverfish and spiders. I like to think the spiders were there because the flies were there. So a whole range of arthropods. What do we find in terms of the bacteria that we carry? In limited time today, it's more of a headline fact. It's a detailed slide. I don't want people to dig into the detail. I want people to kind of think, wow, that is a huge range of things. Down this side here, we have a whole range of pathogenic bacteria carried by various types of arthropod. And what we've got here is an overlap between what we found and what the HSC, the Health and Safety Executive, list as pathogenic. Of the various types of bacteria we found, a small number were listed as pathogenic. So that has that potential to affect human health. So we know that dangerous things are carried by household arthropods. So there are some risks in the home. So just to pick out some of the, the key points uh, in summary from this before we move on to the next few things, um, we found that the flying insects do dominate the household environment. And of all the things found, thinking of that pie chart, a big slice of the pie were flying insects. The remainder were mainly casual intruders. Um, it's not particularly pest species, but we got some potential to cause harm. Further reports of the grey silverfish when we dig down into the detail as well. So the grey silverfish becoming quite numerous in, um, in the UK, you know, we could really class that as an invasive species. So we've added to that knowledge base there. Plenty of these were sampled in, uh, in the Midlands, the West Midlands area, and they themselves were carrying pathogenic bacteria. So it leads us to be more aware of control, monitoring and identification of grey silverfish for sure. Um, not covered it on the, the slides per se today, but Federica did find that, um, makes common sense really, the more porous a building is, and there was that link between there being a greater number of casual intruders present. The number of windows correlated with uh, the number of casual intruders in the premise, premises. I mean, that's not a big finding. People on here, practical pest control setting, it's a proofing aspect. And that's sort of bread and butter to us, but we can quantify that. And um, so proofing is certainly an aspect in terms of what we find. Um, we sort of have this idea that homes are like a giant trap for insects. They're protruding into the sky and 
and collecting things as some kind of artificial human-made sampling point. Um, so that was probably a factor as well. It does make us think, uh, you know, we like to be categorical and classify things as pests or non-pests. Various pest control textbooks and training materials will classify one thing as one, and one thing as a, as a non-pest. And I think it's sort of a bit, a bit fluid in terms of the bacteria that we may find and the numbers in homes. I like to have a more fluid definition of what we class as pests rather than being too sort of dogmatic uh, with that. And what I was really impressed with was the level of detail that we could go to. Um, you know, the work with the uh, um, sort of DNA side, the molecular techniques, it, it, it unearths a hidden world of bacteria that insects harbour um, that we can't find with traditional microbial techniques. So yeah, definitely a hidden world of smoking gun of bacterial signature that we wouldn't otherwise have known about. So almost that complete microbiome of, of insects in household settings. Um, I had a little thought, really. It's probably a Matt Davis obscure thought, um, but it makes some sense. It's almost like the insects we were finding, the bacteria they were carrying, was like a signal, a sentinel, a living monitor, an indicator or sampling device of their environment. They're like little mobile mops that collect things as they as they move along. So it's like a, a robotic insect life sampling device. Um, so yeah, perhaps there's some some value in that one. Yeah, so that was the uh, the latest study from from there. I think um, what I'll do, I'll give you a snapshot. Of, of what's coming up this is sort of uh you know to be continued um you know watch this space kind of research as, as we get onto the university of reading work but going slightly back in time where my interest sort of uh, pricked up in this area moving away from six legs um moving on to four legs and a, and a tail uh, we'll have a quick look at what we've got in store for rodent born disease um I've just been talking about salmonella this morning actually to uh a team of new starters um, undertaking some rodent control training, just letting them know that rodents can acquire salmonella from the environment. It could proliferate within their body and then be shed into the environment via their, their droppings. So sal salmonella being amplified in rodent hosts is a, is a known thing, so of significance. And um, certainly there's a threat to, to poultry there um, with rodent presence in that situation. Um, I'm saying here, Hilton, Anthony Hilton, Aston University, before my time in 2002, they did work on salmonella in urban rats in uh, Birmingham city centre. And 10% of rectal swabs, there's a nice thought for a Tuesday morning, nice bit of uh, rectal swabbing. And um, salmonella in 8% of faecal samples was found. So small numbers, small percentages, um, but small percentages of a large number is a large number, so still of significance. And the salmonella was persisting for many days, up to 86 days in some circumstances. So it was there and it persisted. And this, we had a little flag, a little red flag really, um, salmonella in urban rats. Many other studies looked at salmonella or other pathogens in rats in rural settings. So this sort of brings us round sort of full circle uh, to, to very up-to-date uh, research. And of course, E. coli has been worked on as well. Um, and, for anybody that's involved in bird work, I won't, I won't leave you out. Um, so salmonella in rodents, uh, salmonella in, in feral pigeons is the next, next little clip. So have a look at this one. Now, if you're wondering what Anthony is doing now, we were walking past, he saw some pigeon excrement, and of course he had to test it. Back at the lab, Anthony and his team analyzed the agar plates to see what's developed from our original swabs. That one looks horrendous. What's in that? That is salmonella. We got that from the pigeons that we, that we sampled near the, near the monument. Is that dangerous for my health? Salmonella is, is perfectly capable of infecting healthy humans. You can imagine people sit on monuments, they eat the sandwiches, pigeon feces may be around. There's a potential risk there, isn't there? See, I find that really shocking. And also, it just looks really dramatic. You smell it. Have a smell. What does it smell like? Oh, my goodness. That is absolutely revolting. Yeah, so the uh, the guys working in bird work, obviously there's a serious aspect to that with the uh, personal protective equipment and the use of biocides and disinfectants uh, for dealing with pigeon waste, pigeon guava. So yeah, just to refresh that, uh, we do have that risk from certainly from feral pigeons as a public health threat. Um, just a health and safety warning there, don't go sniffing plates of salmonella, by the way. Um, so that brings us through to sort of uh, the most up-to-date work and you know work in progress. And it's gonna be very exciting to see how things move on with this one. I did have a little check on the participants. I know that uh, Anna is watching, and I know that uh, Soon is here as well. So hopefully, I'll do uh, do justice to the to the team at the University of Reading 
uh, and myself from Killjoy. So our, our current project is exactly this, the role of rats and mice in the dissemination of pathogens and uh, the antimicrobial resistance there. So Anna Carolina Yamakawa and Dr. Soon Guion, uh, our colleagues, collaborators at the University of Reading. So an exciting project. Um, we've got the research team on board. I must make sure that I say a big, big thank you um, to the pest control professionals that have contributed to this research. We heard about Aston University and my sort of history, and we relied on citizen scientists to sample insects. Um, we've had very generous donations of time and uh, rodent dropping samples from, from forward thinking pest controllers. Um, so the project would not work without those contributions. If there are people out there that still have droppings and would like to send them in, then just contact me via my Killjoy contact details and we'll set you up uh, with some sampling kits if you'd like to do that. Uh, but just a quick um, overview of this one. Um, we're very interested in the, the Norway rats, Rattus norvegicus, and the house mouse, Mus musculus. Um, you know, we don't know much in the UK, not a huge amount, some work has been done, what pathogens are they carrying? You know, there's a precedent set. We know that antimicrobial resistant pathogens are found in urban rats. I think most of this research tends to be in the biggest cities, Berlin, Hong Kong, Vancouver, Tokyo. We're very interested in the UK. Um, Salmonella uh, is, is on the radar. Um, and we want to know, is it in the commensal rodent species? If so, what is the prevalence? What is the distribution? Are we finding this in rural settings, suburban settings, urban settings? What are the differences between the pest species? What are the differences between the environments that we look at? If pathogens are there, what is the load? You know, how high um, are the bacterial counts? You know, we talk about infected dose. Are we reaching those levels? And we're hoping to find this information out from um, you know, sampling of the rodent droppings. We, we, we learned from, from prior work, didn't we, that a main route of dispersal of bacteria can be in rodent droppings. Obviously, don't forget about Viles disease, Leptospira, in, in urine, uh, but droppings are a main route of dispersal. Um, so we're very interested in that. And we'll be looking at, in terms of the bacteria we find, do we have that antimicrobial resistance as well? And, you know, there's some similarities with what I talked about recently. We've relied on faecal samples from across the UK and traditional microbiological techniques used, as well as, the, as well as the molecular approach to really dig down into the detail. And then we can make inferences and draw conclusions um, from what we find there. So this will be really exciting to keep an eye on. Um, we'll start to get results very soon. Look out for us at various industry events. Um, I think this is gonna make a bit of a splash, to be honest, um, with the information that we find, because it doesn't just include Norway rats and house mice. It includes um, wood mice as well. So we've taken various samples. We've done it in a professional way, um, thanks to, to pest controllers, um, always following health and safety and hygiene, um, identifying droppings appropriately, very experienced people. And we've been storing them properly, keeping these things dry, freezing them where needed, sending the samples on quickly because DNA can de degrade over time. Um, appropriate records have been taken, which species are we sampled from, what settings are they be taken from, what type of site and what area, and then the observations. So we've got a whole raft of data coming through. Uh, we've had 100 samples. I can't tell you how much that pleases me. What a lovely round number that is. And I'm told that Anna has managed to extract uh, amplified DNA from all 100 samples. 64 Norway rats, 23 house mice, 13 wood mouse samples from a variety of rural, suburban, urban, uh, and, and other areas that we're waiting for. So we see that spread throughout the UK, good distribution of samples for rats and house mice and wood mice. And uh, so it really is one to watch out for. I'll be on tenterhooks waiting for the results from, uh, from Anna and soon. Uh, so just conscious of the time, I have uh, just less than one minute left, so I'll hit the summary slide. Um, for the flying insect side of things, flies are carrying multi-drug resistant bacteria in food areas and introducing and acquiring novel pathogens. We know the history of salmonella in urban rats in city centers. This is the ongoing research to keep an eye on. Bacteria carried by rats, house mice, and wood mice um, going to be something big, I, would, I would think. And yeah, pests don't wash their hands. We do. Um, so take care. I wish this was me. Somebody once asked during lockdown, is this you, Matt? But it's apparently someone called Fly Colangelo with some of those drawings. Uh, never mind. Maybe I'll think of something better for, for rats. Maybe we'll do the same. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for listening. And I've done my job. I'm on time at 11.45. So I hope that pleases the organisers. Thank you. <laughs>
Perfect time, Matthew. Thank you. Did you do that little drawing with the flies and the little legs? Afraid, afraid not somebody else. Yeah, I wish it was me. It's a brilliant idea. I, I can see lots of people going, hmm, I'm going to go and do that just for just for giggles. Um, no, that, that's fantastic. And I think it's an important subject, not, not just for, you know, pest controllers to be aware of these things and they can educate their customers in terms of the importance of, you know, um, keeping safe, um, but also themselves, you know, when they're out there working, uh, making sure they're aware of the bacteria that can, can affect them. So thank you. We've got a couple of uh, questions uh, and comment as well. So Graham here says, Hi, Matt. You say salmonella was recovered from rat feces for up to 86 days. Were the droppings kept moist or did they dry out in that time? I think they were left to age naturally. I'll go back to the original paper and I'll, I'll, I'll ping a copy to, to Graham, Graham, actually. Yeah, I think they were left to age naturally, but I'll, I'll double check and let, let people know. I think it was like a realistic setting. Yeah. Uh, he's right He's right to say that if it was kept moist, then it would be sort of a bit, a bit artificial and match the real world. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and Mohammed, thank you for a highly technical um, presentation. Um, but also, is there, are there any updates on rodenticide resistance? I know it's not really the, the time for it, but would there be anywhere that he can go to get some updates on that? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, the rodenticide resistance action group have updated their website. So go to RAG, R-R-A-G, um, and that'll be the, the latest information all, all on there. Just go and find that on the, on the internet, probably the best way. Good stuff. Um, I think we've got time for one more. One's just popped up. I know we're one minute over, but um, important stuff. So um, Stuart here says EHO working in food safety. Um, they have some small premises with a few flies who do not see it as a problem. However, can we suggest from your research that one or many are still an issue? Well, I like that this one. It's a little bit political. I sort of won't be hold, uh, held, held on this one. I know I'm being recorded, you see. What, is, what you say stays, stays forever. <laughs> I, think, um, I think Stuart's question is a good one um my personal opinion is i'm not too keen on people that set thresholds and levels of um sort of flight activity involvement activity that's my, my personal view because um you know where do you draw the line it is five a low risk and suddenly six is high risk um i prefer to sort of a job by job basis insect insect by insect basis and also mm -hmm. bacteria bacteria basis so i've i've sort of professionally dodged that one um, yeah indeed. yeah <laughs> i think, I think it, it's like a, a pest uh pest risk assessment for the site like yeah. you said, the site specific you know is it it might not be as much of a problem in maybe a, a a warehouse i don't know boiler room compared to a pharmaceutical you know manufacturing line you know they're all going to have different different risks aren't they i think that's absolutely right and then um, you know if stuart um dropped me a line um and i've got copies of the papers i can send out so that'll help your arguments actually because i know you've got a very important job to do and that's quantifiable stuff yeah it's period period it's, it's reliable so you know you can make sound, sound claims based on that very good stuff and i think you you provide templates as well we do for things like a trend analysis for flies and stuff as well yeah. we? we can yeah, help people important. out with so they're always a joy <laughs> by counting okay great Matthew listen thank you so much you were perfectly on time I've run us over a little bit but there were some questions I wanted to get in there so again thank you so much for your time thank you great